As CEO of Procter & Gamble, Alexandra Keith is working to modernize their brands. You heard from her yesterday. Today, she's going to be announcing a new partnership in the UK. So please welcome Alex Keith and Paris Lees. That music is so fitting for you. <laughs> So this is an exciting part of this conversation where you kind of get to know a little bit more about Paris because we know a little bit about Alex, but I thought it's kind of an even keel situation where we need to understand who you are personally because we're talking about branding. So here is your rapid fire round. We have one minute to answer these questions. All time, since we're talking about music all through this lunch, all time favorite singer and song. Oh, Annie Lennox. Oh, a little bird. There you go. She was here not long ago. Oh. Ha. Billy Joel, Vienna. Ooh. One thing you don't, no one knows about you. I, I, I'm an obsessive compulsive cleaner. <laughs> I can do running pace time math in my head. <laughs> Best advice you ever got? Uh, I, do what you can when you can. I'd say follow your dreams. Mm. Favorite city? Oh, uh, 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 Clock's ticking down. Uh, uh, Nottingham. <laughs> London. There you go. <laughs> Favorite place in London? Hyde Park because I run. Ooh. Oh, a, a dirty, sweaty warehouse at 3 a.m. wearing Nikes. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Nottingham. Okay. Favorite seat in the plane? One where I don't have to get up for someone else. Business class. Ooh. <laughs> um, how do you both de-stress? I run. <laughs> runs a lot. Uh, Valium. <laughs> I like your solution better. I do. Valium is underestimated. <laughs> An exercise. <laughs> Jog. I'll do the shrug as well. Um, so introduce yourself, Paris, to this. Um, audience that may not know you. Hello, Who ladies. Who is Paris? Who is Paris? Uh, I am a writer and campaigner, and I'm probably best known in the UK for trying to raise awareness for transgender rights and put forward the idea that uh, trans people deserve to um, live their lives free from discrimination and um, be treated with dignity. But I guess, I don't know, I do a lot of different things, but that's probably the main thing. Writer, activist, and um, tens of thousands of social media followers who I'm, I'm take your word. Yeah, I, I don't keep count. But you don't keep like count? 70,000 on Twitter. Oh, not bad. <laughs> she doesn't keep count. Um, there's a reason why we have you both here. You both are amazing at the ability to brand and rebrand. Alex, you came into uh, this role at Procter & Gamble and uh, rejigged the way the brands were looked at, the ones that were not doing well, put the company and the beauty business back on track. Um, tell me a little bit about the focus point at this point. You have so, a study that you did and yeah, you, yeah tell so me a little bit more. I'm, I'll talk, um, I'll focus on today on our Pantene brand, which is what we call it in the US. A little tomato, tomato. I think here in the UK it's Pantene, so they forgive me. Pantene. <laughs> I will call it Pantene, but please think about Pantene. It's a brand that's been around since 1945, and it is a fantastic product for hair. But as I came uh, to this role, I really looked at that brand, which was not doing very well, and said, the brand is really missing its mission and purpose. It's not emotionally connecting with women that we, you know, that we ultimately would like to use it. And especially in today's world with the importance of purpose um, and mission for millennials and you know, for people all over, but particularly millennials and Gen Z, we're really trying to bring back the mission and purpose of our brands. So for Pantene, which is all about giving women the healthy, wonderful hair they want to have, 
we looked at, a, we did a study with Dr. Marianne LaFrance at Yale University on the transformative power of hair. We did the, we've done a couple studies now with 8,000 women in 11 countries around the world about the importance of hair to how they want to project themselves to the world and how they express themselves to the world. And what we found was, and we talked this morning a lot about fashion and, and beauty and clothes and jewelry and all those things, but in all those countries, hair is more important than almost anything else <laughs> to the way a woman expresses herself to the world. So now, on our Pantene brand globally, we have a platform about the transformative power of hair. And that is coming to life differently in different countries around the world. And here in the UK, I'm really proud to announce today on this stage whoop, whoop. our partnership with Paris to help bring to life Paris's story and journey and the power uh, that her hair and the role her hair played in, in her own story. <laughs> I think we touched a little bit on Paris's role in the UK. She is, um, I think in some ways, playing down how much influence she has in changing people's mindsets uh, about issues that they might, might not understand. And her story is a powerful one. So I, I want you to tell us a little bit more about this transformative power of hair uh, and the purpose that kind of got you from where you were when you were very young to where you are now and what happened? Well, I, th I think that, you know, genuinely, when I, when I first transitioned as a teenager, I was messed about by the NHS like many trans people are, and I wasn't actually getting the, the support that I needed, and uh, I didn't have any medical interventions at that point, so I'd not had hormones, and people were reading me as male sometimes in public, not all the time, but enough to make me very anxious about leaving the house. And I, I went on for a, a year at that time, and the, the way that I was communicating to the world that I was female was essentially, because physically I was exactly the same as I'd been, you know, a couple of months previously, it was the hair, it was the makeup, it was the clothes. And obviously, these things don't make us women. You know, you, you have a shaved head and you're still a woman, but it, it was so interesting to me that it's such a powerful way to communicate because you shaved think. your head at one point when you were a teenager, when, yeah. the, when the start of the Paris Lee's um, journey began, yeah. you had shaved your head. Yeah, because I, I, I knew that I wanted to grow it orig originally because I'd, I'd known, you know, from a very young age, you know, the direction I wanted to go in. And I, I had some really hard times as a teenager and I actually ended up in a Young Offenders Institute and I felt like I've, my life is ruined, I'm, you know, I've, I've messed up. I'm just, I can't even, you know, get through college, let alone make this, what seemed like a completely insurmountable change in my life. And there was no other way for me to express myself in, in, in prison. All I had was my body. And it was this sort of cry for help. It was this sort of, um, you know, just this complete d d despair. And I think that there is an emotional element to her. And I think, for me, why it's such a, it's not the only, you know, thing but it, I feel it's such a powerful expression of, of femininity because you know I think my fear when I was growing up the only time I ever saw trans people in the media or in advertising we were presented as objects of pity ridicule or disgust you know we were never celebrated or you know shown basic humanity and there was always this caricature of you know you've got too much makeup on and it's fake hair fake boobs but this idea that you were artificial that you weren't who you said you were and I think for me my hair's my crowning glory because it, that grew out of my head you know, and I go to I go to bed at night, and it's 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 there, and 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 it's me. You know, it's it's sort of indivisible from me. So, um, uh, it's it's just really nice that this is where the conversation is at in 2019. And that's what it comes down to at some point when you're looking at a change in your customer and the values that they're espousing, and the change that people like you are bringing into the corporate world. When you look at a company like Procter & Gamble or any other corporate out there that is trying to achieve a new wave of branding. 
You talk about it, the core being purpose, mm -hmm. instead of jumping on the bandwagon. Mm -hmm. Run us a little through the, the mentality that your approach has taken um, the journey of the beauty product business in Procter & Gamble. Yeah, I think, I think ultimately, I mean, Procter & Gamble is a company that is very committed to innovation and product performance. But I think, and, we, and this has been a theme throughout, the importance of, of people feeling, feeling connected to the brand and what the brand is about and what the mission of that brand and company is about is very important. So as we've done this work with our beauty brands, and we, we have a broad, stable beauty brands, one of our um, one of our most mission-driven brands is a, is a brand called SK2 in Asia that is all about changing destiny and has amazing emotional platforms about changing destiny for women in, the, in, you know, in many countries. These, these things are very important to tie to the benefits of the products so that the products and the brands are at the front and center because ultimately we're, we're a company selling products and brands but doing it in a way that makes them more important in people's lives. And Procter & Gamble in general, and I talked about this yesterday a bit, views ourselves as both a force for growth and a force for good in our corporate uh, social responsibility platforms. But it wasn't always like life. this, right? It, it, it was a cultural change that ha had to happen. What the, so Procter & Gamble has always viewed ourselves that way and, and led the way in many things over our over 175 year history. But, but ultimately, the cultural change is that we are putting it front consumer facing now. Over the last five to seven years, we've become a lot more public about the, the things we are doing in the world, in the communities in which we live and work, and to bring forward insights that spark conversation in the areas of gender equality, diversity and inclusion, the things that you know, we think matter to uh, society and, and forwarding society, but doing that in ways that fit with our brands, that don't feel co-opted and just latched onto. And that's why this transformative power of hair platform is so powerful globally, because the 11 countries, are they represent all the regions of the world. But what's, what's interesting about them is how they're coming to life differently um, by country, and, and I'll just say in Japan, for instance, there is a huge drive for conformity in Japan, which is probably not a shock to anyone, but women are really pressured socially into wearing their hair a certain way, to the point that in Tokyo, over half of the public schools in Tokyo, if a, if a young girl does not have straight black hair, her parents have to sign a natural hair certificate to say that she did not color or curl her hair. And Pantene in Japan has now been kind of forwarding a conversation about why is this necessary? Why do we need to do that? And it is generating tremendous conversation in the society um, between teachers and students and the news media about why, why is that happening? So we're, we're using these platforms to spark conversations that we think will you know, help, help women have the hair they want. I think there's Which a very cute important. picture of their um, Pantene's ambassador that you can Google. I'm not going to give it any more of a plug than that, but it's worth it. It's also quite a meme as well um, in Japan. <laughs> in Japan. Uh, in Japan. But uh, Paris, when you decide to, you know, take your personal brand and add it to a corporate brand, mm -hmm. what goes through your mind uh, when you decide to make that association? Because again, you're not just an influencer, you are also an activist. Well, it's I- a, It's a thin yeah, road to well, walk on. My integrity is really important to me and it's, it's kind of my, my stock in trade really, but I've always been uh, a pragmatist. And you know, when, when pe I, don't, I, I don't really see myself as an activist per se, because that makes me feel like I should be uh, handcuffed to the, the, the railings outside Downing Street or something. But, um, <laughs> And that's just that's just not who I am. And I, I feel that um, 
I, I just, you know, think that trans people should be treated with respect. And I, I think that actually the the way forward is I, I want trans people to feel included in things and, and not to feel excluded and stigmatised and oppressed and, and that you, you, you can't fully participate in life. So I welcome brands growing and, and uh, going on a journey. And I think that, you know, I'm, I'm very interested in speaking to the mainstream and, and, and taking Taking, you know, people with us because I think that's how you affect real change. So um, there's there's always this thing of, um, you know, oh, is it tokenism and you're you're being asked to do this or whatever. And I kind of think, well, so what, you know, if that's the case, because traditionally people haven't been handing it out on a plate to, to, to people like me, you know. Uh, you know, it could, that could be true if you're a person of colour or any sort of background where you've come from where you've been marginalised. If you can use a thing that makes you different to benefit in some way, take it, you know, take, take that opportunity and redress the balance a bit. So I think it's great that, look, I never actually thought that, that trans people would be celebrated. I thought that we could maybe reduce the stigma, but I didn't realise it would become aspirational. I didn't realise that we'd be winning awards and appearing on the cover of magazines and stuff like... Or at Fortune's Most Powerful Women. Uh, yeah, at Fortune's Most Powerful Women. And, and, and being in advertising, I didn't realise that we could get to that. And what a great message for kids who... Listen, if, if you're a working-class kid living on a, on a council estate like I was in, in the North in 2019 and your family's not supportive it's still going to be very much the dark old days for you, you know? Yeah. We know that there's an epidemic of uh, kids feeling suicidal in this, in this country. I'm sorry to take it there, but we know that nearly half of trans young people in Britain have attempted suicide. So we're not talking about thought about or, or, or threatened to. They've actually attempted to take their own lives. So within that context... Being able to turn on the television, being able to look in a magazine, look online and see that there are brands celebrating people from that community. It's like the middle ground has shifted in the way that when I was growing up, you know, you were getting people like Graham Norton on the television and it was still a little bit like, well, in, in my world, we're being told that gay is a bad thing and you should be ashamed of that. But here's this person who's got a hit TV show. So I think that that sort of cultural change and that involves every aspect of the media, you know, from yeah. from the creative arts to, to, to advertising, because that's the world we live in. No, I agree it's with important you. to celebrate diversity. I absolutely agree. But here's a question for you, Alex, as we um, go into a couple of questions from the audience. Is this something that every company... Uh, has to grapple with that there has to be purpose when they think about their brands having longevity and being able to sustain another 150, 180 years of survival. I do think it's important for brands to connect with people and I think people, the demand that people are putting out there for what it will take to connect, you yep. know, is, is rising. Uh, but I think brands have to do it in an incredibly authentic way. It has to be tied to what the brand's about. Otherwise, it it seems um, like you've just hired somebody to, you know, show for you almost. Kind right. Of Chance to ask two experts about branding. Any questions from the audience? Ask us anything. Ask We've got no shame. <laughs> I, and, I, and I have a bunch of questions here, so not a worry if you don't. But it would be lovely if anybody did. If not, here's what I'm going to turn around and ask you to do. From a personal branding perspective, uh, I know a lot of us wonder about how do we go out and brand ourselves? It's a new environment for women, for minorities, for everyone. So personal branding advice, what did you do that people here can take away back to their organizations and kind of take them on their journey through their careers? Well, I think uh, as a creative person, you should always try to find the thing that you can say that nobody else can say in quite the same way at any given moment in time. People may not like what you've got to say, but I know, for instance, some of my best articles have been things that nobody else could have said quite what I said at that time. And I think as a creative person, that's your sweet spot. I think also consistency, particularly in a social media age, is, is quite important. You know, there are certain people that I go to you know, for the makeup tutorials, certain people I go to for a left-wing political perspective, so, you know, and I think that uh, c consistency uh, in, in, a, in a really complex, confusing world is, is really important. People know what your brand is, is about. Alex? 
Yeah, I think. Pearls of wisdom, please. Yes, I think both whether it's a personal brand or within a company or organization brand, I, I think about it as almost like a Venn diagram. What do you love and what are you really good at? <laughs> How do those two things intersect and what, what do you want to be known for? Mm -hmm. And then seek out opportunities that allow you to, to be known for that. And, mm -hmm. and don't be afraid of the opportunities. Do things that you've never done before that will allow you to be known. And, and I do think consistency, to Paris's point. I mean, once you're clear on that, I, I got this advice probably 15 years ago, and I decided I wanted to be known for really changing the game of the brands and the markets in which I competed, and I went after that. And, uh, and I think I've been reasonably successful at it. Do you think you've done your parents proud, both of you? We've talked about children uh, yes. here, so. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I was telling you, my dad's 80, so he does not have a smartphone, but he has a little binder. He calls his smartphone, and he carries around little articles about his daughter <laughs> and bores all of his coworkers and coworkers' friends with, with his little smartphone binder. So I guess that's, yeah. Paris? My, my, th this is, I've reached the, the uh, I'm working with Pantene now and being in hair advert is, my mum is, just couldn't be happier. Uh, I think she thought, you know, when I was younger that I was going to bring great shame on her and the family and it's, it's gone 180 now. But one other thing I just really wanted to add quickly about branding, which may just seem so obvious, but I think really authenticity is really important as well in, in a social media age. Um, so I try and make sure that everything that I do is really authentic. Authentic uh, enough to make your mother proud. <laughs> yeah, yeah, she's kind of my biggest fan now and uh, you know, I've taken her to Downey Street and stuff, so she's um, she likes she's it. done all right. She only had one child, so you know, I, I feel like I've got her. <laughs> <laughs> well, ladies, thank you so very much for giving us your advice. I know a lot of us will take it back to our organizations and personal branding, corporate branding, it's all important. It's all about you, so thank you. Thank you. Thank you.